Hi folks, today I'll be talking with my friend Larry Nemchik. He's had a long, illustrious career in Star Trek reportage, but today I'd like to focus particularly on the making of the Star Trek Voyager episode Prophecy, which Larry co-wrote. So welcome, Larry. It's an honor to have you here. Well, thank you, Dan, and congratulations on your uh, channel here. Well, thank you. Um, regarding Prophecy, what were the roots of the story idea, and do you recall why you originally chose to write about Klingons? Oh yeah, well... At the time, uh, my wife Janet had been temping to work at, um, at Voyager as it was just getting started and before the world saw it. What she was doing was assisting Lolita Fajo as script coordinator, which in the old days would have been script typist, except now we had, they had computers and it was everything from just getting the script out from the writer to keeping track of the change pages, you know, like the blue, pink, yellow, yeah. all that, and who got them to dealing with all the writers being impatient <laughs> about their changes and getting phone calls from all of, you know, getting the pages printed, dealing with the art department and my Kakuta for the covers. I mean, it was just, it was one of those things where you were in the hot seat. I had written The Next Generation Companion and we'd moved to LA and I had gotten to know the place. Between me having interviewed everybody a billion times and been around and been trustworthy and knowledgeable and her being there was, we were insiders that got to pitch stories. And so as the series got going, we knew about the show, obviously, way before everyone else did, but because we were working there. But um, Janet was very ambitious to be a writer then, and I thought it was a great opportunity. And the two of us team wrote and team pitched, and we pitched several things. And at the time, and this is baby Voyager, right? This is the first few episodes. So we came up with a whole host of ideas. We had like four or five ideas that we worked on. And after we worked on the ones that we really put, one of them I remember was like a, was like a, was like a wagon train idea where Voyager kind of found some people all going one direction and they got in with this wagon train-ish idea. If we form a temporary alliance with other ships, maybe we can pool our resources and escape. And then of course there were problems along the way, which is an idea that got used later, I think. But uh, not from us though. But in the middle of that, we said, okay, look, Balana is a half Klingon. We should do just throw in a Klingon story just because it's a token idea. Oh, look, they're going to have her at war with her Klingon half. It's a Klingon half of me. It's just, it's hard to control it sometimes. It's just, oh, Klingons, because we have a half Klingon in the cast, in the crew. Let's see mm -hmm. what happens when we, A, it's, we're surprised to come across them, and B, have that be a conflict point for her. When we were coming up with these pitches, we are like, okay, this is such a token thing to pitch, but you've got to cling on, you know, the aliens you have are the new aliens. You have a Galaxian and a mm -hmm. Compan. And we, and, oh, and, and uh, I think we tried to do a pitch with, I have to go back and think about this. I think we tried to do a pitch with Tuvok unless we thought, oh, everyone's going to be pitching something with Tuvok. Every, well, from the beginning, everybody was pitching Pon Far stories for Tuvok. You're know, like, well, if they're going to be gone for 70 years, that means that's 10 Pon Far cycles. What happens? <laughs> you know? Yeah. If you must know, I am suffering from a neurochemical imbalance. An imbalance? It is native to my species. Uh, this wouldn't be the kind of imbalance that comes around once every seven years. <sighs> My pun far. So we came up with the whole idea of finding a Klingon ship in the Delta Quadrant that was a generational ship that had that had was there because it had set sail a hundred years ago on old style, you know, it's 70,000 light years, but mm -hmm. between whatever anomalies and whatever, that uh, that they were Kirk era Klingons. Imagine the era they lived in. The Alpha Quadrant was still largely unexplored. Humanity on verge of war with Klingons. Here's the thing. We wrote it as a bottle story. Look how cheap you could make it. Just pull out the Klingon sets from storage. And we said, look, here's your way to say, in our script originally, we had it postulated that we didn't write a script. We wrote story idea, but we fleshed it out. Look, if Klingons have come all this way, what's happened is they've dropped Klingons off along the way. Kind of like Antarctic explorers or something or climbing, you know, Mount, uh, climbing in the Himalayas. There's caches of Klingons back toward home so that as you go backwards, you've got excuses to find Klingon planets if you want to, or find some plot that involves Klingons going back. We should be extremely cautious this close to Klingon space. Tuvok, 
The Klingon Empire is on the other side of the galaxy. We can also get into retconning what's going on with Klingon. We could even retcon the Klingon forehead thing somehow. We can do all kinds of things using these guys now. That that was a Klingon plot, right? It was a generational ship, and you could you could okay, you could explain a lot of things when the Klingons are at their most paranoid. It's the truth. How can you be certain? And wanting to expand, right? Yeah. And this was one of their things they did. Okay. My people have always known the voyage would be long and difficult. We thought of this not so much as a not time travel, but the opportunity to have, you know, time eras in conflict somehow. Only this yeah. time it wasn't time travel. They're in our time and they're in the, it's not a hologram. It's not a dream. It's not some weird vortex. It's like they're in our face for real, but they also, they didn't just pop in, you know, oh, look, they were, they, it, one minute ago it was, it was 2270 and now bang, here they are. It's like, they've had this long journey getting here and they'd had two or three generations turnover. The scientists and the futurists and all that, that study generational ships talk about, but you know, like when you've got a, it's a generational ship. So either it's either that, or it's like you're in, in cryopods, right? Like cons people. Is it possible they're still alive? After centuries of travel, theoretically possible. Mm -hmm. You know, what, how do you do long range travel without having faster than light drive? And one of them was general. One, one of the answers is cryopods like the Botany Bay. One of them is like, is a generational ship. And those are kind of the two main answers, you know. We kept saying Kirk mm -hmm. era Klingons because those are the Klingons that you saw, you know, on Capella 4 and Friday's Child. A Klingon. Grant, no. You know, taking over Organia and then in Friday's Child, you know, being mean and, and duplicitous. I just called the Klingon a liar. When they're dealing with a local population and we're just going through the motions of dealing with them. We're really just going to bring out the guns and take over eventually. But, you know, we're building the empire through enslaved colony worlds. Their empire is made up of conquered worlds. They take what they want by arms and force. And that was that was that mentality. You didn't get that anymore from after you know post alliance, post Kittimer Klingons. We are Klingons, Wolf. We don't embrace other cultures. We conquer them. So that's what we were trying to throw back and do, and have them just be more savage and more you know. I see fear in your eyes, human. The whole idea of what we never have an alliance with you i mean kind of mentality we will not surrender to sworn enemies of the klingon empire and that would be the conflict that they'd come across them these kirk era klingons wouldn't believe that there'd been peace and an alliance they start off with a battle but of course voyagers far out matching them so they decide the strategic thing is to take them into confidence and then take them over from within because they're they're just still humans who cares what 100 years has brought they're still you know puny silly stupid humans we'll wait for the right moment and when it comes we'll seize voyager oh, yes. janeway would have kind of a battle of wits with the klingon commander you know balana was going to be the emotional fulcrum the emotional pivot but you know there'd be something for everybody involved too Kapla, Balana, and after they make peace quote unquote at the beginning Janeway puts Bellana in charge of being the liaison and and she fights it and uh, she's like, no, 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 no. Anyway, the core of the story is that Bellana is the pivotal figure. And then at one point she falls for the engineer or whatever, the Klingon ship. And then she realizes through the plot that she's being used to get at all of Voyager's cool 24th century secrets. And then she hates herself for falling for the guy, then she hates herself for being used. And at the end, as Janet always put it, we felt like there was a latent attraction to somebody that she knew, either Chakotay. I've always wanted you. <sighs> you feel the same way too. Yes. Or Tom Paris. You see, I've wanted this for so long. Part of the climax of the thing was Bellana realizes she's being used. And as Janet said, at the end of the climax, at the climax of the story, she has to choose. She either has to kill her Klingon lover or she has to kill, say, Chakotay or Tom Paris, whoever her 
latent whatever stage heartthrob, you know, whatever her crush attraction is. She's got to kill one of her friends, one of her people, or she's got to kill her Klingon lover. And she finally has to kill the Klingon because they're they're about to, you know, um, do Voyager. It. She had to choose Voyager over her Klingon lover and his people. And so she hates herself even. It's like it's she's putting herself through the ringer here. She's you know, whipsawed back and forth. And and along the way, you can make all kinds of setups, for whatever you want to do with other characters and Janeway and Klingons and old Klingons and new and all that. Mm-hmm. In your pitch, did the Klingons at all manage to succeed at their objective of seizing the Starship Voyager? I No, I don't think so. We had That's why we had Bellana be the pivot point. It was like whichever way Bellana was going to fall, mm. which would be... And you'd say, well, she'd been a Maquis. And this is even before they get into all the self-loathing and her depression, you know, and her, the holodeck suicide, you know, clo- you know, it's almost like she's cutting herself, you know, kind of a, kind of a pathology going on here. I'm not trying to kill myself. I'm trying to see if I'm still alive. So we just kind of sensed that from what was going on with it in the beginning and the basic character description in the beginning. And the fact that, you know, by then they'd had these early, those early bits where she's the most rebellious of the Maquis, the, at least the ones with speaking lines are getting paid to talk. <laughs> she's the one that's the most rebellious in the pilot. And then early on, she's the one, you know, she punches out Carrie. She's not just out of control, she's out of her mind. If you will explain what happened, uh, Lieutenant. She hit me is what happened. They make her chief yeah. engineer and everyone's kind of shocked. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. Are you checking up on your new chief engineer? Observing. And? Two crew members have already filed complaints about her promotion. And she may be in for a tough period of adjustment. But I think Balan is going to make a fine addition to this crew. Our crew. Yep. And the whole point is she's going to shake things up and have some fresh blood, and we're going to have to be unconventional on our own. Maybe I'd do better if I had a little Klingon blood in me. Trust me, it's more trouble than it's worth. And those early moments were where we just kind of took that and ran with it. But it's like, well, you know, she's the Klingon. She's the reason we're doing this story. Yeah. So she's got to be in the middle somehow. And we haven't explored all these aspects of her personality. And, and, and the fact that if she's that, I hate to say tortured, but if that's her Achilles heel... And you say, well, if she hates her Klingon side so much, how does she fall for him? Well, that's what's that's what's maddening. You don't know what's going to happen until it happens, right? You think, oh, I haven't had a girlfriend in a, 10 years. And about the time you give up looking, bang, that's when they fall in your lap, mm. metaphorically speaking. So, you know, it's like whenever you stop looking for something or you stop worrying about it, that's what it happens. And and that's where we went with that. that that's And that's why she's even more pissed at herself because she let her guard down. Mm-hmm. And with these savages, not even the modern Klingons she knew about, but, you know, her mother's colony world and her mother's family. But she's let her guard down to more primal Klingons. And then now, look, she's being asked to betray her people. But she's got this sudden, you know, it's hot. So she's got this sudden magnetic attraction and she's trying to weigh and balance, mm-hmm. you know, this troubled sure. life she's had as a Maquis. Yeah. And now they're stuck 70,000. How depressing is that? She's already barely or she's still reeling, barely getting, coming to terms with the fact that they'd been ripped 70,000 light years from home and she's stuck mm-hmm. on this ship with these people, mm-hmm. you know? So that we thought it was, we thought it was very valid. They'd filmed about five or six shows. So there'd been like five or six episodes evolution okay and you know and on top of this we were insiders but still it's like you never sell your first pitch don't ever expect to sell anything you know they might buy something and then take the story and thank you very much here's a little money whatever the guild says okay so we rehearsed um we went in and pitched and didn't care or already we're doing all of our first three or four stories and of course of all the things that we pitched it's the one that we like blew off. We're like, okay, we'll just do this because la da da. So I didn't know. yeah, and we pitched to Jerry because she was kind of Janet's nominal boss because Jerry was the head writer and Michael was Michael was off working on Legend, but he was still attached to Voyager. 
I've recently been reading a behind-the-scenes document from 14th December 1994 regarding the writing of the prophecy. In it, Jerry Taylor writes to Michael Puller about the version of the story that you pitched with your wife, Janet Nemechik. Can you tell us a bit about Jerry Taylor's document? The day after we pitched, or a couple of days after we pitched, she, in December of 1994, so this is a month before the world saw Voyager premiere, but they'd been filming for six months. And she said, uh, she's, she reworded our idea to Michael, and then he wrote back and hand wrote and said, uh, let's do it, or let's buy it. Now, I read the story that she summarizes, and it's already different than what we pitched, which is okay. It's like, fine, buy it. We'll write whatever you say or whatever. That day, of course, I'm working at home and I just remember, and this is fax days. And so mm -hmm. here pops up this fax where Janet wrote a cover letter and said, we did it. And I'm like, oh my God, because we weren't, you were supposed to do that. Now, what's funny is in hindsight, I've heard from several people, including a couple of people on staff who, were, who weren't writers, who were like other creative positions who were going in to pitch stories. And at least one of them said, oh, we had a Klingons in the Delta Quadrant story. Oh, but right. it's ours they did now. Partly that is probably because they're wanting to give us a break, maybe. They knew Janet especially was really working on her writing and wanted to encourage that. I don't know, but they did. In the documents, Jerry Taylor wrote, essentially this idea involves her picking up the signal of a Klingon bird of prey and rendezvousing with them. This is a ship which left the Klingon Empire decades ago during the Civil War, a generational ship which is peopled with warriors of much more rough and ready sort and whose technology is not up to date. Do you know when or why the Klingon Bird of Prey changed to being a D7 class? Well, we always wanted to be a D7 and everybody mm. wanted it to be a D7. Part of this was, it's just, part of this was pre-CGI, although by the time the show was made, they were using CGI and Voyager. But part of this was in 1994, CGI wasn't available and so everybody's still thinking about physical models. And the Tahinga class from motion picture was like when, when they looked at the physical models built in, in the arsenal in stock, um, the, this is even before the Hallmark models and the Playmates kits, guys, in the AMT model. But the old Klingon ship in the inventory was the Tahinga. It was the motion picture filming miniature, right? Yeah. And... A lot of us thought it would be, if we're talking about old Kirk era Klingons, it would really, really impact that it was old if we could build a D7, right? A smooth sided 60s looking battle cruiser, like right out of the AMT model kit, maybe. And everybody wanted that. But what that meant was in pre CGI days, they had to go and build a physical, pay for a physical model. And how many times are they going to use an old ancient Klingon ship? And again, remember, this is before even the Klingon Wars and the battles of DS9, where it would have been awesome to see. Yeah. Um, and they were still using, uh, Gary Hutzel was still using physical models, too. He put off doing CGI until it was up to his standards. But we wanted to do that, but the, it was always about cost and money. Well, we have to build this model that we're never going to use again. So, mm -hmm. But it was our intention to have it physically be, and have that be a cool factor for everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's really interesting to find out. What was the Civil War that the Bird of Prey was intended to be from? Although there is a Klingon Civil War depicted in the TNG two part of Redemption, there's clearly not a huge amount of time between that and the first season of Voyager. So was Voyager actually to originally be set decades after the Redemption two part? Here? No, no, no. The 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 um. Oh, you're right. Well, see, that wasn't part of our pitch. We had always said Kirk's era. We look, we even said you can do smooth heads and you can use this to introduce some reason for the distinction between the smooth heads and the bumpy heads, mm -hmm. whether it was like a disease, which is what they wound up doing, but or whether it was, you know, the gaming world had come up with an idea about inter, you know, interbreeding humans and Klingons so that Klingons shock troops would be able to infiltrate easier like Arn Darvin, right in tribbles mm -hmm. yeah and and uh, it wasn't such a stretch and we had said you know you can use this as a platform to, to introduce any kind of big format change for klingons and and retcon star trek history that you want to mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing they would <laughs> that's the kind of thing that the uh, kurtzman era would jump on and that's the kind of thing back then they would they'd be like well, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves here we don't want to tie our hands in the future i mean that would be kind of the, that was kind of the reaction so we, we had this whole 
here's four or five or six different pivot points you can you can use this to do all these different things if you want to and they didn't do anything with any of it in the in the end of it and so anyway so yeah jerry's retelling of our story that's why i say we were kind of like okay yeah that klingon civil war threw us to answer your question finally okay. that was that was another one of the bits of, of jerry's paraphrasing for michael that we were like okay i don't know where that came from but just be quiet they're buying the story shut up <laughs> in the document jerry taylor concluded by saying i think it's a second season show and i know it's somewhat vague right now but wanted to run it by you for your thoughts in general below this michael pillar in handwritten pen wrote let's go ahead and develop it what's funny is immediately we had that story we went in for a story meeting brandon was not there but it was ken biller who was very junior much a writer it was um, michael and jerry and ken biller and brandon wasn't available and that was really the writing staff then they hadn't staffed up big time yet mm. and i just remember we sat there and michael said now what happened was legend got canceled it didn't last very long and so michael was he, he was like distracted and then back full time take you know wanting to make himself you know busy and so it was Michael and Jerry. So we had the top two people and then Ken. So we're sitting there and Michael goes, Michael, who's now been liberated on time, says, you know what? I think this is a great vehicle. I think it's a bottle show, but let's, let's, let's build it up. Let's make it. Be Why don't we have, instead of having Voyager just stumble on their ship and they get into a fight, why don't we have Voyager come across this native planet and they beam down and they're incognito or whatever. So it's like prime directive. They're not disturbing them. It's a pre-warp civilization of primitives or something. And they get there and there's Klingons on the planet who have come along and subjugated them. And we're like, okay. He's like, what do we, and we could have like a language for the natives, what they did later on with basics, right? So Janet and I are going, okay. We were trying to make it cheap, but okay yeah we can do that he's like and then and ken biller goes from like junior writer being quiet over in the corner but the only other person in the room he's like yeah and what if like it's like the it's like the japanese guy who was hiding in the jungle and didn't know world war ii was over for for 20 years and we're like okay okay <laughs> but these were all ideas being thrown at us but Michael's like, so just go back, write a new story document, make it on a planet, make the Klingons have a subjugated race. Da, 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 da. And mm -hmm. we're like, okay. So we did that and we spent a lot of time working that we had it really cool. We had Balana and Chakotay in a shuttle going into this planet that had a weird magnetic effect and they crash land. We're losing altitude. Propulsion is offline. Voyager, we're going down. This planet is very arboreal. It has a very thick, like a jungle forest, and they crash land into the top dense layer. We had this whole thing of where they're upside down, their shuttle, they get out and they open the door, and it's like, you know, 300 feet down to the ground. I mean, it's like just bizarre stuff. We were, you know, it's like, oh, shoot for the moon. Okay. Just for the image. And it would be easy to produce on their, you know. So, anyway, so we went home and did that. But meanwhile, the time's going by. Okay. So we wrote on that for a couple of months, came back. Well, by that time they had done faces, faces where oh. Bolanas physically split into her Klingon and, and human has, and they get into the whole Bolana hates her, her Klingon self side story. Do you realize that we're each fighting with ourselves? I'm not the one who's fighting the Tuch. So when we came back with that, it was, you know, Jerry and Michael were kind of like, well, we just did a Klingon, a, a Bolana hates her Klingon half story. Why don't we put this off to the second season and we'll keep working on it? Okay, because they were like half, they were th two thirds of the way through by then. We're like, okay. So we come back and we work on it some more. And then it's like, well, we've had an awful lot. We've had Ferengis and we had a Romulan. It's beginning to feel like the Delta Quadrant isn't so alien after all. You know, mm -hmm. all these Alpha Quadrant people popping. Why don't we yeah. save it for another year? And we're like, okay. And then it gets to the third season of Voyager. And by that time, they've had the Klingon year on DS9. And Worf has come to DS9. Commander Worf. Welcome. Chief, it has been a long time. Too long. Welcome aboard. Just what the station needs. Another Klingon. And it's all about the Klingon war and yada, yada, yada. 
And they're like, well, if we do a Klingon story now, it's going to look like we're just copying DS9. So that was the gist of it. But look what's happened. By the third and fourth year, Tom and Bellana are dating. And she never would have fallen for a Klingon, you know, on the other side and all that. She never would have gotten, e you know, the whole point was to ease her into being comfortable with her own, with her own kind that way. So mm -hmm. by the time we got to the third or fourth delay, I just looked at Janet. I'm like, they're never going to use this. They're never going to use this now. So it went on the pile. And yeah, they paid for it. We got paid as a story by, I mean, a purchase story. But it was, you know, it would have been cool to see it produced. But oh, well, we can at least say we sold a story. Now, we kept pitching. And I kept pitching on my own and to both to both to DS9 and Voyager. Nothing. We never sold another story. Although two of our two of my ideas on DS9 got used. Well, one of hers and one of mine on DS9 got used. Oh, it's cool. the it's the great old oh look, our friends have honored us by ripping us off kind of thing, war story. So, you know, by then Janet was still working on writing, but she we we were all, you know, three or four years in. Since your original idea was about a group of Klingon ancestors of Planet Taurus and was pitched as early as the first season, do you think it was a tall and flangel on such later Voyager episodes as the 37s or Distant Origin? I don't think so because, well, you had Brannon in the mix and Brannon was always good for time travel and, mm. and what they used to call on TNG weird shit stories. This is strange. As far as like Distant Origin and and the 37s, I those feel like... The 37s feels like, uh, hey, let's do a time thing with Amelia Earhart since we've got Janeway. Let's come up with a plot around that, you know? I want you to know, you've always been an inspiration to me. Because of you, generations of women have become pilots. And Distant Origin, I, I love that episode. It's one of my favorite Voyager episodes. But because, and Jerry at the time said, this is, we feel like this is one of our most Roddenberry esque episodes because it was all about. Um, uh, religious faith and theology versus science and all that. Oh, but it's aliens theology, not ours. Before this, all we had was a theory. Now we have proof. We simply have to get them to open their eyes and see it. So, no, I don't think so. Ours was really Bolana driven. What about you? Don't you have some of those feelings? I'd be lying if I said I didn't. Somewhere along the way, after about three or four years, before Jerry retired, Janet went in and she said, by the way, Jerry, is our story just dead? And Jerry, and by that time, Michael had stepped away from the show. He was consulting totally. And Michael was not in the day-to-day -day mix. And Jerry just goes, can you just go back and write the original story you pitched? <laughs> like lose the aliens, lose the language, lose the subjugated you know, natives. Just go back to the original story you did and write that. So we did again, but again, that was, you know, that was on down the line. So you fast forward finally to the last season. So Brannon is off developing Enterprise with Rick and he stepped away from show running. And all this time, seven years later, they've elevated Ken Biller still there the whole time. And he's running the show the last year. Yeah. And I went around and said hi to everybody. Oh, good to see everybody back after hiatus. Stayed in touch. And when I went by his office, he said, Larry, do you still have the notes from that story you sold at the beginning of the show at the series? I go, yeah. you know, and, and me not wanting to get excited, go, yes. He goes, well, we've been looking for, we're trying to, we were looking for them in the archives and nobody can find, which is, it's like the, it's like uh, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, it's stuck in the warehouse. to find the note the box with all the notes from that pitch and sale we can't find them can you send me your we might use it and i'm like okay don't get excited because lots of things can happen <laughs> don't tell anybody it's very cool but okay this was exciting like out of the you know, ashes right the phoenix <laughs>
Back from the dead. I've been dead before. The short of it is then that they did use it, but by seven years going by, you couldn't have the characters in the same, you know, the characters had all grown up. They weren't baby characters by then. Oh, 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 oh what's the matter, Harry? Oh, does my costume frighten you, huh? <laughs> all right, that's enough. Jerry's retired. Now Brandon's off. So, you know, and the show has evolved. But Ken did ask me for that. So I went home and I said, don't get excited but they want to see our notes from our pitch. And she's like, okay. <laughs> and Janet's very good about keeping her mouth shut too. So we did that. And lo and behold, not to look excited, but every once in a while I would kind of say, are you guys still looking at the, yeah, it's still. So then I see the script status reports and I go, oh, except now uh, Mike and Phyllis have worked on it. And uh, Ken and Raph Green, who work, wrote with him some the last season, and of course, the stories change. It's still the core idea of, oh, it's the Klingons and Delta Quadrant and Balana is the central figure. Although now they've, she and Tom are already together. So that's a moot point. That can't be the, that can't be the drama point. And mm -hmm. so they come up with the whole thing about the Nevet and the disease and the baby being a, you know, being a prophesized symbol. So all that plot came out. I was hoping our daughter would be special, but I never dreamed she'd turn out to be the Klingon Messiah. And what they did, um, was the story you saw prophecy now ours had ours had different names one of them the names was reflections uh was one i remember but anyway we had three or four titles as we went of course we had the original bottle story where it was just on the nose so in the eventual script it did the two or three generations was this disease developed and they've been fighting it so you know that was a that was a that was baggage of having been a generational ship you've been traveling for four generations but on a generational ship, do you worry about, you know, if it's a limited colony, you worry about DNA tiring out or whatever, or what if everybody, <laughs> what if everybody's pissed at everybody, nobody wants to procreate, you know, or whatever. So unless your cloning ability is up to par or something, you don't have to have people get along to have babies. Um, <laughs> but all those kinds of, you know, and, and, and the genetic, you know, whether it really happens over just three generations, say, or whatever, but, <clears throat> you know, genetic fading and taking a toll on the the health of the population when you can't get out and <clears throat> excuse me you can't get out and make it fresh and that's kind of where they picked up on when they went that way it, you know we knew that it had to be updated because our original crux like i said of, of balana being in in indecision um that was a moot point now unless it was really going to be dramatic if you really wanted to to um you know blow up her and tom over this <laughs> You could do that, but that would be huge stakes. And yeah. that obviously they didn't want to, that wasn't where this went. And then it turned into, you know, Tom defending her honor by she's pregnant. But not only is she with Tom, she's pregnant at the time they do this. So were you able to visit the set? It was an old tradition that if it was your first sale, whether you lived in LA or you were on staff somehow, or you were in the area or you could, people traveled in, but it was an old tradition that if it was your first sale as a story, whether you did the script or not, that you got to come in and watch. And so, but like, we're there now. Um, Janet worked five years <laughs> before it got to her. <laughs> so she wasn't working on the show then, but I was on the lot three times a week working on Star Trek.com, working in the archives, working on, you know, license projects, uh, the fact files back then. And so I was there a lot more than she was, but she came back and yeah, we watched, we went over to the sets but the day they were filming was the was the was actually the Klingon battle where Tom is fighting mm. is fighting the Klingon in the holodeck. Warriors, assemble! And he's all decked out in his Klingon gear. <laughs> I think Maggie was uh, the script coordinator. Lolita had retired by then and become a full-time uh, agent for ac actor appearances. Um, so Maggie was doing scripts. And so she, she, you know, printed us out two or three pretty scripts. <laughs> and, um, and I had one, so, so I've got, you know, call sheet from the day. Well, I had call sheets anyway, but I had one call sheet where everybody signed it. I've got a, a script where everyone signed, you know, the cast all signed it. Um, I had the director sign it too. 
And we went over to the old sets, to the old bridge that they'd filmed so much on. My old friend, Jeff Mandel, who was working in the art department, decided that Klingon ships should have a dedication plaque the same way that Federation ships do. And so he made, he came up with this triangular design, you know, with Klingon font around the edges and a crest in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it's on the back wall and uh, you barely see it. And he said when he typed in the Klingon font that he typed it in as the IKV Nemechek and then whatever Klingon came up is what it says. So that's not canon, but that's the story behind that. So at the end of the show, we took pictures around that. Janet and I did. We took pictures in the Klingon captain's chair, even though most of that set was like never seen. Um, so yeah, we have a memory of that. Of course, we had no a real emotional attachment to Tom fighting the Klingon. So we watched for a while and we went over to those sets and took pictures because that was cool. But um, um, what's funny is at the end of it, Jeff came to me and he said, okay, I meant when we finished filming and we tore, you know, we struck the sets, I was going to go over and get that seal, that Klingon registration plaque triangle mm -hmm. thing. I was going to go over and get that for you. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, here you go. He says, but when I went over, somebody already ripped it off the wall. And I was like, oh, he said, so this, which is why I always make a backup copy. <laughs> so oh, we have oh. the, we have the Klingon dedication plaque that in his mind says IKV Nemechek. So that's always been a fun, you know, a fun little story to, to tell people. Oh. Then what's sad is the part that was the most out of our show got cut for time. They spent all this money on all these Klingon extras and they did a Klingon bridge and they had the dead captain of the ship that had just died from the disease and they do a Klingon funeral and they screamed to Stovokor and the whole thing. It was very cool. Mm -hmm. And then it, most of it got caught. In the beginning, you know, it's like they you see these Klingons and you're like, what is this going on? Because it's Voyager. Why are they having all these Klingons? And it's a funeral and they do the thing. And then at the end of the, the scream to the dead, somewhere who's still on his console goes, Captain, uh, we're picking up signs of a Federation warp signature. What? And then that was the end of the teaser. And then you were off and running in, in their script. And then mm -hmm. for time, sadly, and another scene later on too, they cut the entire, <laughs> they spent all this money and all you see is barely anything of that opening, you know, the opening scene before it all shifts over to Voyager anyway. It's like they did all this and then they lost it and the, the deleted scenes are out there. And by the way, the, the graphic in the bridge set is a D7. I don't know if you can tell it mm -hmm. on screen. The art department prepared D7 graphics and along the way they said, oh, we can't do a D7 model. They would always fudge it and make it a Tahinga, which is what they did, you know, a motion picture style battle cruiser, even though we always, and that was a thing, Dan, that went on all through Voyager and DS9 and even into Enterprise. <laughs> there was supposed to be an episode with eight and, you know, D7 gets mentioned and it doesn't famously, all the tech heads know all the ship nerds know that it doesn't match. They talk about a D7 and it's not a D7. And originally it was going to be, and that's why they didn't change the script. It's a D7 class cruiser. D7? They were retired decades ago. It was just going to be a CGI model. We don't have to build it out of plastic and you know fiberglass. But yeah. at the last second, they were like, oh, we're out of time. Let's just throw in a just throw in a Tahinga in there. No one's going to care. And they're like, but you've already said D7 and this, you know. Anyway, and they didn't redub it or anything. It's the Nerette. It kills all of us who aren't fortunate enough to die in battle. It's a retrovirus that destroys the cells by attacking the cytoplasmic membranes. So a few weeks after we're done, they're cleaning up maybe at the end of the season or maybe at the end of the show. So Mike Akuda comes, finds me somewhere and he goes, oh, Larry, I've got something for you. I go, okay. And there's a, there's a seed pod in a certain kind of tree that's very familiar, at least around, around here and a lot of the world, I think. Anyway, it's very, if you look at it, it's very kind of wacky looking. Um, that day, they were having to come up with a graphic to show the little bit of footage that where they're scanning and they have those viruses. We're very familiar with virus looking, you know, globular things with spikes on them now here during, anyway, Mike goes, here, Larry, be careful. Do you, have you had your shots? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, have a, have a virus. Oh, cool. This is, this is the seed pod that he picked up off the ground, took in the yard department and scanned it just in a 2D scanner, like a copying scanner to make an image. And then that they imported that into whatever. 
and made the graphic and then you know made dozens of them had them rotating and and colored mm -hmm. and all that but anyway that's this is the klingon Nuret virus and i said oh cool and then he made me a little he made me a uh an okudogram sticker there it's a type 47b <laughs> retrovirus and you know it's a it's a it's an okudogram capsule so that the end there i don't know if you can see it says wash hands before returning to work at the very end So there's a piece of prophecy too. So I've got two, I have two mementos from the prophecy shooting. Very nice. Aside from my autograph script from everybody. The other thing was they were good enough because I guess they knew us. By the time that had gone through so many changes, they paid us. They did not have to keep us on the credits. And as it wound up, there were six names anyway. So all the residuals, you know, all the payment at the at the moment and then later as it trickles away, but all that payment gets divided six ways now. <laughs> so it's like they could have easily cut us off and just divided it four ways, but they didn't. Both the script of Prophecy and the episode itself cites yourself, but not Janet as having been involved in writing the episode. Do you remember why this was? Janet wanted her pen name, yes. She, she had a foot in different worlds, and until this really took off, she just wanted to she just wanted to have her pen name, just like Gates McFadden used Cheryl McFadden, you know, for her stage work and Gates McFadden. Yeah. So nobody would find her slumming on this sci-fi syndicated series at the beginning. Yeah. Or, or DC Fontana used her. Or DC Fontana. Right. Well, to get to be to be bought as as uh, as not a woman or mm -hmm. thinking that she yeah. would have less chance. Yeah. She portrayed her woman in, in the early 60s. The final version of Prophecy aired on 7th February 2001. What do you think of the final version of the episode? And is there anything you would have done differently in it? Oh, it's fine. It's wonderful. It's fine. I'm glad it was made. I'm shocked that it was pulled off the slush pile and made at the end. So we'll always be grateful to be to have a foot in the fraternity of Star Trek writers. The 100th episode of Voyager, mm -hmm. there was a special, they do this for shows on their 100th episode. They yeah. do a special section. The trades will sell a special ad section and do some articles and interviews. Uh, the trade mag, like Hollywood Reporter and Variety. And Hollywood Reporter did a special 100th episode edition for Voyager. And the writers, some of the writers took the lead and they did a, um, or maybe it was, you know what it was? And it was like the 30th anniversary of Star Trek, I think. Anyway. All, right. all the writers, not just Voyagers, took out and uh, the current writers took out a full page ad in one of the trades. And they had everybody who had ever written for Star Trek it accredited. So it was staff writers, freelancers, everything. And it was like a huge page with, you know, mm -hmm. original series forward um, wow. from Gene onward. Um, and and uh, I don't know, there's like 100 names on it. And even though prophecy slash reflections slash whatever had not been produced, it had been bought. And so they were nice enough to include us. So we're in the big page, <laughs> J. Kelly Burke and Larry Nemechek are on this big page of writing. So, you know, it was like, even at the time, even when we thought they weren't gonna make it, it was very cool to be, to think you were included in that fraternity of writers that yeah. had contributed at least something to the, you know, some much more than others, <laughs> but you know, to that pantheon. So when it was finally made, it was kind of like, oh, that's cool. but. The other thing is you don't know that there's any, it's like the disease comes at you out of the blue in act three or act four. And that I think is a weakness. It's, it really comes off as a MacGuffin, as a Dois Machina, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it doesn't solve the problem, but it's like the problem of the script comes at you halfway through the show, which seems a little awkward. The Nourette always comes without warning. Oh, and the whole thing with Neelix and the Klingon woman is just hysterical. I think that's, that's great. And yay for Neelix and yay for, for Ethan getting to do that. I'm really going to miss her. So no, we were fine. We had a, we had a watch party at our house. We had, there were like 30, 40 people at back at the time we rented a big screen TV and, you know, and watched it when it aired on the network and, and um, had a party for you know, 20 or 30 people. And so, yeah, of course, the whole time, as many others have had to do, a lot of people, you know, their name is off the credits and they sold the kernel of a story or 
-hmm. it's the same thing. They've got even less of a stake in the finals. It's an idea. It's not even like a person or a thing. Well, we're going to take your idea, except we're going to have it be uh, Jordy, not Riker, you know, or something. Yeah. So that all of those, it's, it was after interviewing people for years about what pitching was like and how nerve wracking it is. And to be, go through the story process and you talk to people, people from, you know, Iowa or Arizona who pitched thanks to Michael from off lot and not being a, a professional writer yet, maybe to professional writers and the staff people who pitched ideas and they totally get transmogrified by the time you see what's on screen. And that's, what's, that makes a fascinating story for those like us to to keep up with, yeah. and um, and to chart all that and to know the what ifs and the the roads not taken and that's always fascinated me. So yeah. so then to have it happen to me <laughs> as a case study, uh, you know, yeah, true, yeah. was kind of interesting too. But to sit in the story, oh yeah, you sold the story. Now they're going to totally change it in the first story <laughs> conference. I'm like, oh yeah. okay, what what guy in the jungle who didn't know the war was over how does okay okay ken okay <laughs> and then Sorry, jerry going no. just go back and rewrite what you pitched originally let's get it back to like square one <laughs> after it kind of you know oozed over and then to have external factors you know delay you know mm. so and so i'll always be you know i'll always be very grateful to jerry for buying it to michael for buying it and then you know, thank the prophets or thank Kalis, I guess I should say. They kept, you know, they resurrected it. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> and then kept us on it. So we, so now, you know, every quarter we get, you know, $12 or something, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, cool. Your ancestors would be honored. <laughs> That's the story of prophecy. Thanks very much, Larry, for this interview on the Scotch Tracker. Where can people find you on social media these days? Oh, uh, at Larry Nemechek on Twitter and Larry Nemechek's Trekland on Facebook and on Instagram. And everything is at Uh We do the, the Trek files for Roddenberry. Uh, have the live show twice a week, Larry, uh, Trekland Tuesdays Live on Tuesday afternoons on my Facebook and YouTube. And on Saturday mornings, we have uh, Life Support Live with Dr. Ali. It's uh, going boldly through uncertain times. Um, cool. Very proud of that show. And uh, yeah, we're all over. So, um, and of course, the old Next Gen Companion, if you still find that and Stellar Cartography is out there, copy back there. Awesome. So yeah, but thank you, Dan, for having me on your new show. And again, congratulations. Thank you. That leaves me to say thank you very much for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. Also, feel free to post in the comment section. See you next time. Bye for now. Check well.